So the chapter we've just read, 1 Samuel chapter 8, um, presents a really, a, a really significant event in the history of Israel. Um, up until this time, the Israelites had been ruled by a series of judges. There was a number of different judges that had been in charge, ruling over them. Um, and, and what we see here is, here Samuel's getting old, but his sons didn't walk in his ways. They, um, they, when they didn't walk in his ways, what that basically means is they went in another direction. They went in a different direction than what their father went. Now, it's not clear that his sons were bad to start with. You know, I mean, this is quite unlike Eli, who was an earlier judge, where Eli, remember, he had sons, and his sons were wicked. And Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, I think it was, they were wicked. In fact, they were so wicked that God wanted to kill them. Yep. Now, that's a pretty bad situation to be in. It's a pretty bad situation to be in where God wants to kill you. Now, some people have the idea that God is an all-loving Father Christmas type of person who only desires good for everybody. Isn't there a lot of people that have that sort of idea? But here's the thing. The Bible tells us something very different. In fact, we sang earlier on, we sang Psalm number 11. Psalm number 11, what does it say in Psalm 11 verse number 5? It says, the Lord trieth the righteous, means he tests the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Now some people, some people just read over that. Some people sing that without even thinking about it. What does it say? It says, the Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked... And him that loveth violence. So someone who's wicked, someone who loves violence, what does God think of that person? God loves him. No? The wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. His soul hateth. And then in case we missed it, look at verse number 6. Actually, keep your finger in 1 Samuel 8, because we'll look at another psalm as well. Turn to Psalm number 11, just so you can actually see these words. Look at Psalm number 11. Psalm number 11, in verse number... Verse number five, the Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked in him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. And then he says, look, upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and in horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cups. In case you're thinking, well, you might, you might say that, you know, God hates them, but, but, you know, he doesn't really. But he's raining fire and brimstone upon them. Mm-hmm. I mean, does anyone remember a city called, remember a city called Sodom? Sodom yeah. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? What did God do? He rained fire and brimstone from heaven upon those cities. <coughs> And completely destroyed them. He completely destroyed them. You'll be there in um, Psalm number 11. Look back at Psalm number 10. Psalm number 10, it says, Look, Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. What does it mean to abhor? If you abhor something, that means you really hate it. You really hate it. Whom the Lord abhorreth. Who's that? The covetous. The wicked, through pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. He hath said in his heart, this is a wicked man, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He sitteth in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. This is this wicked person. This wicked person. Notice, in secret places doth he murder the innocent. Do you know that there are innocent people that are murdered today? There are. You know, go to an abortion clinic. Innocent. You can't get more innocent than that. And they they are murdered. He says, look. He doth murder the innocent, his, pro, his eyes are probably set against the poor. He lieth and waits secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth and waits to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him into his net. He croucheth and humbleth himself, that the poor may fall by his strong ones. He hath said in his heart, what does he say? God hath forgotten. God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. He thinks, I'm going to get away with this. It's okay for me to murder babies for a living because what do you do? You know, I've got, I've got my Lexus, I've got my BMW, I'm going to get all these, you know, I'm going to get paid lots and lots. Okay? He says, that, that's what he says is going to happen. He says, look, God doesn't remember. I mean, what are the most of them saying? Well, because there is no God. They don't believe God exists. What does the psalmist say? Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up thine hand, forget not the humble. Wherefore doth the wicked contemn God? This is why does the wicked hate God? Why does the wicked contemn God? He had said in his heart, Thou wilt not require it. Thou hast seen it. 
For thou beholdest mischief and spite to requite it with thine hand. The poor committed themselves unto thee. Thou art the helper of the fatherless. Break thou the arm of the wicked and evil man. Seek out his wickedness till thou find none. And notice, what I'm reading here, this is not just some, you know, some random person who's got vengeful thoughts. This is the psalmist. You know, and the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. This is God's word. And what is the psalmist doing? He's praying, God, revenge. Take revenge on these wicked people. Take revenge on them. Break thou the arm of the wicked and evil man. Seek out his wickedness till they find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of his hand, out of his land. Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt cause thine ear to hear to judge the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may no more oppress. You see, here we see in the Psalms, God clearly has got a pretty bit of distaste for some people. And the psalmist actually wants God to commit revenge on some people as well. You might say, but surely that's not the... Oh, we sang Romans 12 before. You know, we're not supposed to seek revenge. Well, actually, no, the Bible says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So the psalmist wants God to take revenge. It's not that he's taking revenge, but he wants God to take revenge. And that's actually not a bad attitude to have. We should want God to take revenge on wicked, bloody people. You know, there, you're there in Psalms, look across at Psalm number 15. Psalm number 15. You see, some people have the idea that to be a godly, righteous Christian, you have to just, oh, well, I just love everybody. We have to just love everybody, because God loves everybody, and I love everybody, so that makes me like God. Well, let's have a look and see what it says in Psalm 15. It says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell on thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness. Understand, the person that's being talked about here is a good person. He walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue. He's not, he's not you know, going behind people's back. He's not backbiting with his tongue. Nor doeth evil to his neighbour. Nor taketh up his re- a reproach against his neighbour. But notice verse 4. In whose eyes a vile person is contemned. What does that mean? It's a vile person. Is contempt- if you have contempt, if, what does it mean to contemn someone? It means to have contempt for them. It means to have hatred for someone. In whose eyes a vile person is contemned. Not doesn't say in whose eyes a vile person is loved. In whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth his own hurt and changeth not. So you're just picking just a few random scriptures. Look, I mean, you can find this throughout the Bible. You know, just look up God hate it. You know? And, and, and righteous people, you see, if we were to be righteous, then the, the place to look for a good example of that is in the Bible. You know, you can look at, look at, um, look at Job, for example. Remember in the book of Job, remember, remember when God, in the book of Job, described Job as being an upright and perfect man. He was the most upright man on the face of all the earth. That's what Job was described. He was described like that by God. In other words, hey, if you're a role model, you know, people have role models, say, people they look up to. And often they look up to, you know, sports stars or, you know, people like that want to emulate these sort of people. But look, this is the sort of person we should emulate, someone like Job. And what does it say about Job? Look at Job chapter number 29. Job chapter number 29. It says, Moreover, Job continued his parable, Job 29 verse 1, and said, Oh, that I were as in months past, as in the days when God preserved me. In other words, this is when, when life was going well, before all his family died and he lost all his stuff and, and got horrible diseases. Remember, God allowed those things to happen? Okay, and it wasn't that God was doing that, but God actually, it's like he took, the, took his hand off some of the protection that was around Job and allowed Satan to do what he wanted. He says, when his candle shined upon my head and when, I, when by his light I walked through darkness, as I was in the days of my youth, when the secret of God was upon my tabernacles, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were about me, he's looking back at happier days, happier times, when I washed my steps with butter and the rock poured me out rivers of oil. You know, says, these were good prosperous times. When I went out to the gate through the city, when I prepared my seat in the street, the young men saw me and hid themselves, and the aged men arose and stood up. In other words, he was respected. Job was respected. The princes refrained talking and laid their hand on their mouth. The nobles held their peace and their tongue cleaved to the roof of their mouth. When the ear heard me, then it blessed me. And when the eye saw me, it gave witness to me. Because, why? Because I delivered the poor that cried, and the fatherless and him that had none to help him. You see, he was a very charitable person. He was helping the poor, he was helping the fatherless. The blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. He's just doing good to all around. And I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. My judgment was as a robe and a diadem. 
I was eyes to the blind and feet was I to the lame. In other words, he's just helping everybody. I was a father to the poor and the cause which I knew not, I searched out. He didn't make hasty decisions. He searched out the, the, the right port, the cause. Verse 17. And I break the jaws of the wicked and pluck the spoil out of his teeth. So in other words, don't, don't, don't misunderstand this. Does Job sound like well, he's just loving and kind and distributing the teeth? He says he breaks the jaws of the wicked. So in other words, there's a balance we need to have. There's a balance we need to have. We need, the Bible says God is love. But the Bible doesn't say God is only love. God is love, but he's not only love. Because we've just read verses that talk about God hating you know, and so it's important we have the, we have this perspective. You know, it says in Psalm seven verse number eleven, it says, "God judgeth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth." That's not the one I was going to quote. Psalm seven verse eleven says, "God judgeth the righteous, but God is angry with the wicked every day." God judgeth the righteous, but God is angry with the wicked every day. Look back at Psalm number five. Psalm number five. There's another one we sometimes sing parts of the psalm. We don't often sing the first three verses. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For unto thee will I pray. My voice shout there here in the morning. O Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayer. And to thee will look up. But look at this verse 4. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness. Neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor. And that means really hate. The bloody and deceitful man. So we, know, we need to understand, look, there's a balance. There's a balance. It says in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And you want the fear of the Lord, the Bible says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. You see, some people have the idea that God loves everybody, and that if we want to be like God, we have to love everybody as well. Well, look, if you love everybody, you're not like God. If you love everybody, you're not like God. You're not like the psalmist. You know, you're not like Job, who was the most upright man in the earth. You say, what does that have to do with the sermon? Well, turn back to 1 Samuel chapter number 8. 1 Samuel chapter number 8. 1 Samuel chapter number 8. The title of the sermon this morning is Choosing a Ruler. Choosing a Ruler. And you see, if we're looking at who should be a ruler, we need to have, we need to have God's perspective on things. We need to have God's perspective on things. And looking in 1 Samuel chapter number 8, this is a chapter about doing what? Yeah. Choosing a ruler. Yeah. Choosing a ruler. It's around about sort of election time in New Zealand. Uh, I guess in the US it's coming up pretty soon. In fact, even at work, they're choosing a new head of department in my, in my department. You know, it just seems like it's that season where there's going to be a change or, or, or not of leadership in all sorts of different areas. Yeah. Now, when it comes to cho choosing a ruler, we would do well to listen to what the Bible says about it. Listen to what the Bible says about choosing a ruler. And to begin with, what we can see is that, look, Samuel, he made his sons judges. So Samuel was a judge, and who chose him? God did. He was appointed by God to be judge. But who appointed Samuel's sons? Samuel did. Samuel appointed his sons. This is mistake number one. Mistake number one. Just because they were Samuel's sons, that didn't mean that they should be the next judges. That didn't mean that they should be the next judges. Second, look at second, keep your finger at first Samuel. Eight, look at second Samuel, chapter number twenty-three. Second Samuel, chapter number twenty-three, and verse number three. Second Samuel, chapter number three, excuse me, twenty-three, and verse three says, The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me, He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. The person who's ruling, well, notice it says he that ruleth over men must be just, and it says ruling in the fear of God. Turn back to 1 Samuel 8. What we can see here, look, it came to pass when Samuel was old, he made his sons judges over Israel. Now, the name of the firstborn was Joel, the name of the second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba, and his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after Lucas and took bribes and perverted judgment. Well, that seems pretty different, doesn't it? He that ruleth over men must be just. What do these guys do? They perverted judgment. Yeah. That's the opposite. That's the opposite. And why were they perverting judgment? Well, I think it says they turned aside after Luca and took bribes. What are they after? They're after financial gain. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10 says, The love for the love of money is the root of all evil. 
which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Why is it that so many rulers, so many, so many politicians become corrupt? The love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. There was a time when they were called public servants. You know, there was a time when people that were in positions of power, like within politics, they would be people who supported themselves. They already, they had earned money and they were doing it as a service. They weren't doing it for the money. Like it wasn't a career that you could have. You had to be able to pay for your own way in life. And you could do that because you actually wanted to genuinely help people for a period of time. And they had obviously limited office. But now people do it, and what they do it, well, I mean obviously you, in some countries they have limits where you can only be a president or something for a certain number of terms. I don't know if we even had that. I don't think we had that in New Zealand. I think you can just do it as long as you want. But um, obviously they have an, an election every three years. But, and you can be an MP and it can keep going. But what happens when you retire? What happens when you no longer... You get paid a pension. So they don't even... Not only do they pay you for doing the job, they pay you when you don't do the job. How did that happen? Maybe because they passed the law saying, hey, let's pay ourselves in the back pocket. I'd say that's what happened. Crooked. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And what are these guys doing? Bribes. They turned aside after Philip Luca. The reason they turned aside from the right path that their father walked in is because, hey, guess what? There's, there's financial reward. There's financial reward. Look at verse number four. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. So the elders here, they were right to complain that Samuel's sons weren't following in his ways. They were right to say, look, look your sons aren't following. They shouldn't be judges. That, that was right. But then what did they do? They asked for a king. They asked for a king. And that was the wrong thing. Why didn't they just say, look, your sons aren't walking in your ways. They shouldn't be judges. We need a different judge. We need someone else to be judged, not your sons, because they're crooked. We need someone else to be judged. That's what they should have done. A better judge than Joel and Abiah. But instead what? They wanted to be like the nations that were around them. Look, make us, now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Is it a bad thing to be like the nations around you? Well, didn't we sing Romans 12 before? We sang Romans 12 before. Be not conformed to this world. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Ye may prove as a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be not conformed to this world. That means don't be like the nations that are around you. Don't be like the people that are around you. You'll know what God's perfect will is? Not being the same. I mean, it says in 1 Peter 2 that we're supposed to be a peculiar people. What does that mean? Peculiar means different. A peculiar people. Different from the world around us. People should understand say, look, they're different. They behave differently. They don't behave the same way as everyone else. In fact, we, didn't we sing it in 1 Peter 4? That they, where they think it's strange you don't run with them to that riot of excess with drunkenness and revelings and all that sort of things and abominable idolatries. That's not what you're like. And they think it's strange. What's wrong with them? You know, it's Saturday and you're not getting drunk. What's going on? You know, you empty your, your recycle. Where's all, the, where's all the beer bottles? Where's all the spirits bottles? Where's all the wine bottles? It's not there. What's wrong with you? We're supposed to be different. Look at verse number six. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. You see, Samuel knew that what the people were asking for wasn't right. Samuel, Samuel's not happy about it. And what does he respond by doing? The same thing we should do. He responded by praying. By praying. The Bible says, be careful for nothing, but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then it says, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Take it to God in prayer. And this is exactly what Samuel did. He took it to God in prayer. Verse number seven. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people. God says to Samuel, listen to them. Hearken unto the voice of the people. In all they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. So he's saying, look, it's not you that have rejected Samuel, it's actually me. God tells Samuel it's a rejection of the Lord rather than a rejection of Samuel. Because look, the Lord is the one who's supposed to be their king. 
The Lord is the one who's supposed to be their king. Look at Isaiah chapter number um, 33. Isaiah chapter number 33. Isaiah 33 and verse number 22. Isaiah chapter number 33. Isaiah 33 and verse number 2. This is a great um, verse to underline in your Bible. Isaiah 33 and verse number 22 says, For the Lord is our judge. Who's our judge? The Lord. <coughs> the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. Who's the one that makes the laws? It's the Lord. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. That means who's the boss? God is the boss. He will save us. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Also notice back in 1 Samuel 8. 1 Samuel 8. Also notice, look, God spoke to Samuel. It says, the Lord said unto Samuel. And understand, when it says the Lord said, that means this wasn't just a thought. In Samuel's head. Samuel didn't just have some thought. And said, oh yeah, this is God's, God's speaking to me. God's speaking to me. That's not what it was. He actually physically spoke to him. You know? Look across to chapter number 9. Chapter number 9, just across the page. Chapter 9 and verse number 15. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear. So did he hear him? Yeah. The Lord told Samuel in his ear. So we need to understand, look, God was actually speaking. He was, a, he was a prophet of God. It says in Hebrews chapter 1, God, who at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. God spoke by the prophets, but he spoke to them. They actually heard him speak. You know, when Moses went to the bush and it burned, God spoke to him out of the bush. Moses heard him. It wasn't just some voice in his head. But see what we, what we see happening here in 1 Samuel, verse 7. He's, being, he's saying, look, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. Why would he say that? Maybe because no one really likes to be rejected by people. No one really likes to be rejected. It's not something that feels pleasant, but the fact is it's a part of the Christian life. You know, if you want to be pleasing to people... If you don't want anyone to reject you, you won't live the Christian life. You won't. You will not live the Christian life. In fact, I think Paul writes in, um, I think it's Galatians chapter number 1. Look at Galatians chapter number 1. In verse number, I think it's verse 10. Let me just get there and see. Galatians chapter number 1, verse number 10. He says, yeah, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? You see, there's a problem in being a man pleaser. If you try and please men... What's going to happen? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So you've got a choice. You can please men, or you can be the servant of Christ. Oh, I'm going to be the servant of Christ and please men. That's not what it says. He says, for if I yet pleased men, if I did stuff and just, yeah, I just make everyone happy. You're not serving Christ. You can't. I mean, Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. Father will, you know, hate the one, despise the other, hold one. You, you can't do it. You've got to choose. Is it people's approval or is it God's approval? You know, it's a choice we've got to make. And here's the thing, look, when we stand with God, when we stand on God's side, many people will be opposed to us. I remember, I'm going to talk a little bit about the actual later, very minimal, I'm not going to... Nathan's frightened I'm going to read this big whole thing up, but I'm not going to go anywhere near that. But it, it must have been three years ago, the last election. Leading up to it, I, I, I put some stuff out there. Um, in fact, all I did was just put a post out. I put a, put a post out on Facebook. Just an image that was from a, a, a was it Value Your Vote website. Yeah. And it just showed the, the political position of different parties yeah. on different issues, which Christians, most Christians would think to be important things. And I'll just, just put it out and say, this is what, you know, this is what the, this group has done. And I can't remember, it was, th it was like, I think it was even tens of thousands of people that, res that responded. Wow. This is the most popular post that's ever been. And it was just all these people just, and a lot of them were saying, whoa, I'm a Christian, oh, I don't agree with that. You know, Jesus loves homos, and Jesus is into this, and Jesus is into smoking dope, and you name it. I mean, it was just, <laughs> the ignorance was, it was, it was incredible. It was incredible. Jesus you know? Because oh, I, mean, I mean, that's here's the thing. 
we shouldn't get our ideas of we need to get our ideas of God from the Bible. Because if you get your ideas of Jesus from the world, well, the, the world thinks that Jesus was a long-haired, dope-smoking hippie. Wow. Isn't it? I mean, you what? Yeah, white skin, long hair, wearing a dress, roaming around, going, peace. That's right. Isn't that what they think about Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> but that's not the God of the Bible. Didn't have long hair, short hair. You know? If he didn't have white skin, he would have had olive skin. Yeah. Light skin. You know? This would have been. I don't think he was roaming around wearing a dress either. But here's the thing. And he wasn't saying peace. He wasn't saying peace. I mean, Jesus said, think not that I'm come to bring peace on earth. He says, no, I tell you, nay. He said, rather division. I come to bring a sword. He says, we're going to set you know, a man against the people of his own house. You know, father and mother and children, or children against the parents, parents against the children. That's what he said. Why? Because you've got to decide. You're on my side or you're on the world's side. That's you've got to decide. When we stand with God, people will, many people will be opposed to us. Look, don't take it personally. It's really God that they're rejecting. So when tell me someone spouts off, you know, when I had a relative of mine telling me, you know, you're not being very, very Christ-like. You're not being very quiet. And look, this is, this is an atheist relative of mine. And he's going to tell me all about how, how God is and how Jesus is. You know? Don't take it personally. Look, it's God that they are rejecting. It's God that they're rejecting. It's like when you go to Solomon and you go and you preach the gospel to people. And, you know, you've had someone scream in your face and curse and swear at you. From this far away, I have. I've only ever had it once. And it was, yes, it was homosexual. But look, it's one of those things that he wasn't rejecting me. He was rejecting the Bible. That's what it was. You know, I mean, what did I say that made him so upset? He said, are you saying that, you know, because I didn't bring up homosexuality. I was actually preaching gospel to someone else. And it was a flat, you know, the flatmate comes up. Too. I was preaching gospel to someone else, and the flatmate comes up, and he says, butts in and says, are you saying that homosexuality is a sin? He says, of course it's a sin. The Bible's full of sins, you know? Homosexuality is a sin? I mean, I even, I even compared it to lying. Now, you couldn't get any more, you know, what people would think, oh, a pretty minor sin, you know, telling a little white lie. Isn't that what people say, telling a little white lie? You know, because look, we're not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not out, when I'm out solving, I'm not out to expound on, you know, the biblical doctrine. I'm just about preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. Mm. And so that's why I didn't try and escalate things. I said, oh yeah, homosexuality is a sin, lying is a sin. Yeah. You know? I'm a sinner, you're a sin. What do you do? Yeah. But that wasn't enough for him. Yeah. That wasn't enough for him. But look, did I take that personally? Yeah. No, because it's not about me. It's not about me. It's God that he was rejecting. Yeah. It was God that was making him angry. <laughs> because God was saying, look, this is right and this is wrong. And when it's like your entire lifestyle, everything about you, God says that, that is wrong. You know, the average sinner, they don't like that. Anyway, let's get on. Verse number eight. He says, look, according to all... So, so he says, look, it's not you to rejecting, it's me. He says, look, listen unto them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even unto this day, we were... They've forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. You see, one of the reasons why people reject the things of God is because they want to live a life of sin. They want to live a life of sin. Now look, understand, look, we all still sin. It's not that you've got to stop sinning to be saved. Good luck, that no one will be saved. But look, there's a difference between trying to please God and coming short, which is what we all do, compared to denying that they're doing anything wrong. To say, look, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. I'm not doing anything wrong. You know? I mean, a great verse that talks about this in Proverbs chapter number 30. Proverbs 30 verse 20 says, Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I have done no wickedness. So what's she doing? She's partaking in stuff she shouldn't, and she's saying, I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't done anything wrong. That's the, that's the way of an adulterous woman. And it's the same with an adulterous man. They deny that things are wrong because, look, they love their sin. It's like the scoffers in 2 Peter 3. The scoffers in 2 Peter 3, they walk after their own lusts. And because they, they want to walk after their own lusts, what do they do? 
They deny. They're willingly ignorant of the Creator. They're willingly ignorant of the judgment of the flood and of the coming judgment. They do not. Why? It's, and the Bible says they're willingly ignorant. Why? Because they're walking after their own lusts. Because of what they desire, the sin they desire to walk in. Look at verse number 9. Now therefore, this is what God says, now therefore, hearken unto their voice. He says, hearken unto their voice. Howbeit, yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. So God tells Samuel, look, listen to the people. Listen to the people who are asking for something that they shouldn't. Be careful what you ask for. Be careful what you ask for. I think, it was a, I think he preached a sermon on that day. Be careful what you ask for. Because God might give it to you. God might give you what you ask. But tell Samuel, look, warn them. Warn them about the king, what the king is going to be like. Look at verse number 10. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots. And he will appoint him captains over thousands and captains over fifties, and will set them to air his ground and to reap his harvest, and to make his instruments of war and instruments of his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be confectionaries, and to be cooks, and to be bakers. And he will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. And he will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. And he will take your men servants and your maid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work. And he will take the tenth of your sheep and ye shall be his servants. Look, the king is clearly going to exploit the people. He's going to exploit you. He's going to take things that belong to you. You, you know, your sons, your daughters, he's going to take them all. He's going to tax them. And how about he going to tax them here? He will take the tenth of your sheep. And you should be his servants. He's got a you know a ten percent tax. Mm. Look, ask yourself today: if we just had to pay ten percent tax, wouldn't that that would be tax relief? That would be great if we only had to pay ten percent tax. But this is that you see, that's what the king's going to do. You know, one of the reasons why we have high taxes today is because we have a government that is power hungry. We have a government that's power hungry and wants to micromanage every area of our lives. And when you want to get into everybody's business, you know, you need a lot of fingers and a lot of pies, but you need a lot of money for that. So you've got to take money from people to be able to do that. Yep. You know? I mean, look, have you seen the COVID-19 signs? They're still everywhere, aren't they? Mm. All over there, you still COVID-19, COVID-19, stay back here, stay back there, stay a metre here or meet two metres there, just depends on where you are, you know? Where did all that stuff come from? Where did it come from? It comes from a group of people who think that they can manage your health better than you can. <laughs> That's who it comes from. You can't, look up, you can't look after your health. They need to look after you. You know? They need to blow your nose for you and wipe your bottom. That's what they need. They, need to, they, they want to look after you. I mean, look, these are the same clowns who have promoted the food pyramid. Yep. Isn't it the government? Yep. They're in charge. Look, here, this what we, we recommend. This. Everyone follow this, this healthy food guide. The healthy food pyramid. And how long has it been around for now? About 40 years, give or take? Yes, right. And what's happened over the last 40 years? Obesity, Obesity explosion. <laughs> Diabetes, explosion. Yep. Cancer, through the roof. Yep. Heart disease, through, I mean, you name it. Yep. It's like, it's almost as though if you let the government be in charge of something they will make a complete pig's ear of it and just destroy everything. That's what it seems like. I think that's what it actually is. You know, people who follow their advice, people who follow their advice, and they get sicker and sicker and sicker as a result of it. You know, you can find processed foods that have got a four or five star health rate. You know, you go on the show, four or five stars. And, and it's processed garbage. You know, I looked at a bottle of cream the other day. A bottle of cream. Do you know what I had on it? You know, you see, you know, from a cow, you know, the, the, the good part. The part on the top, the part you want to put on your porridge or something. The cream. 0.5 stars. Health rating. That's what it is. 0.5 stars. That's crazy. 
You know? I mean, these people, don't they? They say, eggs are bad for you. You know, cholesterol, it's going to give you a heart attack. Eggs are bad. Meat, meat, that's bad for you. Salt is bad for you. Let me introduce you to something. This is the Bible. This is, there's much better health advice than the Bible. Do you know eggs are good? Eggs are not bad. Eggs are good. In Luke 11, Jesus says, scorpions are bad. <laughs> okay, scorpions are bad, but eggs are good. I mean, these, the, the clowns doing their help, they probably think, yeah, scorpions are good. <laughs> eggs are bad. You know, toast up to have scorpion on toast. That might be good for you. You know, the Bible says, look, let me quote from the Bible. Salt is good. Salt is good. Salt is good. Yep. Now, obviously, we don't say salt is good. Let's clarify that. What I'm talking about is real salt. Like a- actual salt. You know, in other words, like, you know, you get the, you know, the ocean dries up somewhere and you get the big salt beds. That, that sort of salt. You know, not necessarily the stuff that comes in a little wee white and blue jar. <laughs> not necessarily that stuff. Okay, not necessarily. The stuff that's sold is salt. Because, you know, they've got, other, they've got things like, um, what do they have an anti-caking agent? Do you know that they put that in salt? They put an anti-caking... Um, do you know they actually <coughs> even put sugar in some salt? But they, they, regular salt has anti-caking agent. Why is that? Because, look, why does salt cake? What, when it cakes, it means it sticks together. The bits stick together. Kind of like when Nathan, he's, he was using the, the salt and he, he got water in there. And so there's, it's all stuck together in these big clumps. Why does that happen? Because salt... Sucks water into it. It attracts water. That's one of the things it does. And so to avoid it, you know, to make it not cake together, they put other stuff in so that it doesn't do that. But that's making it not like salt. Because one of the things is salt's supposed to attract water to itself. So if you have salt that doesn't have that property, I don't know what it is, but it doesn't seem like salt to me. And they take a whole pile of other things out of salt as well. You know, do you know they take other things out? Because salt's normally got... Things like, there's normally magnesium in salt, there's normally potassium in salt, there's normally calcium in salt. There's, in fact, there's a whole countless list of things. What they do is they actually, you know, like boil it up and separate it. And they, well, we can sell off the potassium separately. We can sell off the magnesium separately, you know. And so the stuff you get, that basic cheapo salt, regular table salt, is that, yeah, okay, maybe that's not good. That's not what Jesus is talking about, because that stuff wasn't around. That stuff wasn't around when he was saying salt is good. And that's the thing, you know, you say, but what about all the scientific studies? The scientific studies showing that salt's bad for you. Well, well, here's the thing. What sort of salt do you think they'd be using? They'd be using the salt, that sort of salt, or, or, or just the salt in processed foods. That's what they'd be using in their studies. You know? In fact, I was looking at this study. This is an interesting one. There's a, I was reading this, this email from um, the... It's called, I've been doing a bit of reading lately about the whole vaccine stuff and the... Um, there's a group called the Informed Consent Action Network, yeah. which is basically saying, you know, people should be allowed to choose what they inject into themselves or don't. Yeah. And they, they, they sent this email, and it was, saying, it was talking about the, um, the Verivax, Verivax vaccine, and it says that, that Merck sells the first and only chickenpox vaccine, which is called Verivax, sold in the United States. And it's produced by growing chickenpox virus on the cell strain from aborted fetal tissue. So, step one. It was licensed by the FDA in 1995 for people aged 12 months and older. Prior to the FDA licensure, a new experimental vaccine such as Verivax, they're expected to undergo long-term placebo-controlled clinical trials with typically tens of thousands of participants to ensure their safety. So before you just go off injecting something into people, you're supposed to do trials on lots of people to see, is this actually safe? And because there's rules and regulations to say that's what you're supposed to do. <coughs> so to evaluate whether Merck met any of these criteria... The Informed Consent Action Network, they got their lawyers and they basically demanded the FDA produce copies of the clinical trials. Because if you've licensed this vaccine, what are the trials? You know, so produce them. And it took them 14 months before, any, before they actually got anything. You know, so there's over a year. Like, so how, I mean, how hard should it be? The stuff should be all there, easily accessible. But to produce them, even a single thing, they had to be taken to court. And eventually... Eventually, they gave in, and they and they sent some stuff. And what they sent them was ten thousand pages. 
encompassing all the clinical trial reports. So I think they obviously should have said, here's a whole pile of stuff, thinking, well, no one's going to read that. But fortunately, they've got a number of people working for them, and they did. They got people to go read through and see what it actually says. And what they found out is that this product, it should never have even been licensed. Because in all these trials, there was only one trial that included placebo. Do you know what a placebo is? A placebo, that's when you, you, know, you, you know, give, give the, the, the drug or whatever it is to one group, and then the other group you give not a drug. You give them you know, sugar, pill. sugar pill or you know, something, some inert substance, something that's going to do nothing. Okay, when you're injecting it, it's normally you'd inject a saline solution. You know, it's going to do nothing. Well, here's the thing. Only one of the trials had a placebo, and that placebo contained neomycin, which is an antibacterial thing, which if you look it up online, you'll find out there's a whole pile of side effects that you get yep. from this. So do you know what that means is? The placebo is not a placebo. It's something else that can have adverse reactions. Okay, they, um, in this trial there was about a thousand kids and half of them received Verivax and half of them had the, the supposed placebo which wasn't really but then here's the thing they gave them the injection they monitored them for, for 56 days to see if there's any clinical complaints and then an extra two weeks after that to see if there's any, just anything serious so you're talking a couple of months then what they did is, let me get the right date, nine months later, so after doing this study, nine months later, they then gave Verivax to the people in the placebo <coughs> arm as well. So that means that it's impossible to find any long, if there's any long-term issues raised by Verivax, you can't see it. Because the placebo, which wasn't even given a placebo because they actually had something else, well, nine months later, they all had Verivax. So there's no difference. It's impossible to see. 50% of them could drop dead of cancer. Well, same thing's happened for both. You know, and this, this is not a rare thing. They've done it. There was another study they had where there was just, um, they had 60 kids. Same thing. 32 received Verivax. 29 received nothing. After eight weeks, the control group, same thing, they give them Verivax. And so what it shows is, look, they go, oh, the science, it's all... These guys are heavily invested. They're heavily invested. There is money to be made, a lot of money that has to be made. In fact, I was just reading a list the other day of the um, top, the highly paid, most highly paid federal employees in the United States. And on the list, and there's a different list, but the one I was looking at, number one on the list, the top federal who's being paid the most, Fauci, is, is Tony Fauci. You know the guy on you know the guy that's always on the promoting vaccines? He's the teacher, he's paid four four hundred and seventeen thousand dollars a year. He, that's more than the presidential salary. He gets paid that. In fact, nine out of the ten that I saw were health advisor type people. <clears throat> Here's the thing. These pharmaceutical companies, they're some of the wealthiest in the world, and they've got a vested interest in people being sick and needing medication. They've got a vested interest. Yeah. In fact, look, they want to medicate people who aren't sick. Because, look, it's one thing to have a medicine that you can give to sick people, but what if you can give a medicine to everybody, <coughs> you've got it made. I mean, think about all the people. Oh, you need a statin. You need a statin. Isn't it like supposed to be one of the, the highest, you know, grossing drugs around? Or what about this? What about telling people that they need to be protected from getting sick? That's vaccines. I mean, look, Bill Gates and all, all the buddies he's in bed with, what do they want? They want to vaccinate the planet. And look, and don't think they want to vaccinate people once. You know, you're going to get your booster, and you're going to get your booster, and you're going to get it every year. That's what they want. The love of money is the root of all evil. Let's get back to um, 1 Samuel 8. Look, the people in, you're going to be exploited. And we need to understand, look, the people that are ruling over us are exploiting us. They're making money hand over fist. They are. I'm mean, just look at this thing over in the states. The number of um, senators and you know high-ranking politicians in the states who are multi-millionaires is very high. 
And it's not that they, well, it's millionaires who are going into politics. It's people who go into politics, and when they go into politics, they're not millionaires, and then a few years later, they are millionaires. And it's not because their salaries are so high, it's because there's money coming in the back door. A lot of it. Look at verse number 18. He says, look, you know, this is what your king's going to do. Tenth of your sheep, you shall be a servant, and you shall cry out in that day because of your king which you shall have chosen you. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. The people are going to cry out to God because of the king that they've chosen. Now, it's true that God actually ends up being the one who chooses the first king. But they're the people who chose to have a king, which was not what he originally wanted. Now, understand, look, this is not a surprise to God. When the people came to Samuel and said, look, we want you to appoint a king for us, God wasn't like, I didn't think they'd do that. That wasn't, look, I mean, look, let's turn backwards in the Bible. Keep your finger on 1 Samuel 8. Turn back to Deuteronomy chapter number 17. Deuteronomy chapter number 17 and verse number 14. Deuteronomy 17 and verse number 14, page 220. Deuteronomy chapter number 17 and verse number 14. And God says, look, when thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. Doesn't it always seem like God knew what was going to happen, and even why they were going to do it? Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. And he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt. To the end he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. It seems like God's, like God's warning. Don't go building up some great big army. Don't go multiplying wives. Don't go fleecing the people for all the money that you can. Instead, verse 18, And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book. Out of that which is before the priests, the Levites, take, he needs to write his own copy of the Bible. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life. Then he may learn to fear the Lord his God. Remember, we had that at the start. He needs to fear. He needs to fear God. To keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. Because that's one of the problems when someone is a ruler. As they think, wow, oh, I'm, I'm better than anyone else. I know more than anyone else. Mm. I, should, I should get to make their decisions for them. I want to make the decisions. But he says, look, that his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end he may prolong his days in the kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. You see, the aim of the ruler, he should be aiming to promote holiness and righteousness, following God's commandments. But today, rulers today spend most of their time creating new laws which do the opposite. You know, spanking your children is bad according to the government. Prostitution, hey, that's good. You know, the Bible says if a man won't work, neither should he eat. But the government wants to give money to people who refuse to work. I mean, the recent policies in New Zealand and probably many places around the world have put a huge amount of people out of work and made them dependent on the government, which is exactly what they want. They want you to be dependent on them. It's, I mean, it's, it's the USSR all over again. Verse number 19. Oh, I'm in Deuteronomy. Try this one. <laughs> Nevertheless, <coughs> see, look, he's warned them. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, Nay, nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto their voice, and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, Go ye every man unto his city. 
In spite of all the warnings, the people still demanded a king. Because look, they wanted to be like all the other nations. They didn't get what they wanted, though, did they? You know, the king, did the king always go out to battle before them? Or sometimes he just stayed home, didn't he? Samuel told God what the people wanted, and God said, listen to them. They got their king, but they didn't really get what they wanted. They really got something they hadn't planned on. The title of the sermon is Choosing a Ruler. We need to have leadership in all areas of life. We do. We need to have leadership. One of the reasons for this is because, look, a lot of people know very little. And they need some sort of direction, you know, whether it's in a family. You know, a family is not a democracy. You know, you take a family, you know, the the little kids, they they really, you want to have a lot of input from the little kids, don't you? Because they know lots. You know? I mean, you guys ask Solomon when you're making decisions. You know, he says, well, what, do you, what do you think, Solomon? You know, should we buy this or buy that? What do you think? You know? No, you don't. You know? You don't. But here's the thing. You do need leadership. You need someone that's in charge that's going to decide. That's going to lead. You need that in a family. You need it in a church. You know? I mean, I'm not in favour of voting and things like that in churches. And one of the reasons I'm not in favour of voting in churches is because in the average church... There's more women than men. You know? It could easily be 50-50. But guess what? You take a church that's got 50-50 men and women, or maybe slightly more women than men, guess what? If you put things to a vote, who's running, who's ruling in the church? The women are ruling, because they're the ones who are voting. What about in the country? What about in the country? You need leadership. You know, I'm not an anarchist. I'm not believe. Don't believe there should be no laws. And no, we do need laws. We do need, you know, rulers and leaders. But we don't want it to be like these kings that exploited people. We don't need every area of people's lives to be regulated, and that's what they want to do. Like they're in the business of making laws, and they're making laws and making laws and making laws. The Bible is a pretty small book if you compare it to the laws of New Zealand. It's a pretty small book. Or any other country for that matter. You know, I mean, there's so many laws. You couldn't, that's the thing, you couldn't even know them all. Well, what's the point of having a law when no one even knows? So many laws being passed today, they're the opposite of what the government is supposed to do. It's the opposite. I mean, look. Look at Romans 13. Romans 13 outlines pretty well what the ruling authorities are supposed to do it says in verse 13, Romans 13 verse 1 let every soul be subject unto the higher powers for there's no power but of God the powers that be ordained of God whether it's in a family, whether it's in a church, whether it's in a country having leadership, having those in authority, that's something that God ordains whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God and they that resist shall receive themselves damnation for rulers are not a terror to good works but to the evil that's what should be the case. Now, is that always the case? No, it's not. Will they then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and they shall have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. You see, it is biblical to have a ruler that's backed by the authority of a sword. He beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God. He's serving God. So you better be someone who fears God. A revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. That's what the sword is for. Wherefore you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute. This is what you pay tax for. Pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. That's what you're supposed to pay tax for, so that they've got money to execute vengeance upon the evildoer. That's what they're supposed to do. But of course, that's not what actually happens. They do the opposite of that. I mean, what, what laws have they sneaked through lately? Didn't they sneak through the abortion laws yeah. under the cover of COVID? Right. So what's that? That's not having a sword executing wrath upon the evildoer. That's doing the opposite. That's, that's you know, using a sword to kill innocent, unborn babies. What's the next ones they're bringing through? Euthanasia. Killing the old folks. Oh, you're a burden to society. 
You know, and I mean, look, you can look at other countries where it's happened. Mm. And guess, you know, at the same time, oh, we're against suicide. You know, we're trying to bring down the suicide rates. But, you know, no. <laughs> but kill yourself, that's fine. <laughs> what? What else we got? Cannabis? You know? But look, the fact is, people aren't, people don't go to prison for, because they've smoked a joint. They don't. That's nonsense. Mm. But look, you change the laws, and what's going to happen? It's going to make it, it's going to promote more of it. I mean, Helen Clark, Helen Clark wants to legalise all drugs. All drugs. She wants, you know, pee, you name it. She wants everything legalised. The whole thing. They're continually writing laws to make things the opposite of what God desires. Now everyone over the, 18, over the age of 18, they've got a chance to cast their vote for the people that they would prefer to lead our country. I encourage you, look, think carefully. Think carefully when you cast your vote. If, if you decide to vote, some people decide not to. Some people have a question, should we vote for women? You know, should we vote for children? Now it talks about that in Isaiah 3.12. Ask my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. They that lead thee cause thee to err. He says, it's not a good thing. But here's the thing, I mean look, if I had, let's say for example I had, um, let's say there was a man leading the Labour Party. Andrew Little. <laughs> is he in, he's in the Labour Party, is he? Yes, I know my apologies. Yes, yes, yeah, I think so. Let's say for some chance Andrew Little was the leader of the Labour Party. Yeah. And let's say there was some woman who was the leader of the New Zealand Conservatives. You know? Oh, I'd better vote for Andrew Little. No. You know? I mean, here's the thing. You've got, you've got to make your own mind up who you're going to vote for. You've got to make your own mind up. I recommend you... Have, I mean, here's a good example. Here's a good thing to look at. There's a, there's a website called Value Your Vote. .org.nz. Value your vote. That's the one that got me into trouble a few years ago. And once again, they've got their... They go through sort of the generally family-friendly um, laws and so forth and policies. And I'm like, You can see what the leaders, what they're in favour of. Like black. That those are the sort of the anti-family ones. And Labour's pretty... You know, Labour and the Greens is as worst as you can probably get. But Judith Collins is pretty bad too. Winston, Winston Peters comes off on here as being pretty good yeah. and he did last time too but of course when he gets in then it's a different story because the love of money is the root of all evil yes. the love of power but yeah I, I encourage you you know look into some things but decide when you're deciding to cast your vote remember that there are wicked people out there and think should we really be voting for wicked people People that hate God. Bloody and deceitful people. People that think butchering, you know, and what was that one? The, the um, oh, some of the, some of the thing, some of the amendments that people wanted to make to the, the abortion law. Yeah. Just sort of basic, sensible things. Just anything to make it not so bad. Yeah. And pretty much all the MPs. Went, no, no, no. Most MPs. From, that's from all the parties. Turn to 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter number 5. We'll finish up. In 1 Peter chapter 5, we see this is a good example of what leadership should really look like. In 1 Peter chapter number 5, it says, The elders which are among you, I exhort. So I, I personally believe that you know, leadership, they should actually be older. I think they should. Now, if I've got a choice between voting for a really a young person who's got reasonable morals and political values versus an older person who's, you know, wicked as the devil, <laughs> you know, he says, look, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. You see, that's the danger, whether it's in the church, whether it's in, you know, in the country. Filthy lucre. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. That's why I think one of the best, 
qualifications as someone who's actually lived life, who's raised a family, who's worked themselves. You know, I think the police used to have a policy like that, where you couldn't just leave school and go and become a policeman. You had to actually work a job before you could go and become a policeman. That was a good thing, because they want people to actually have work first. They could do with that in politics. That'd be a good idea. Might get rid of Jacinda that way. <laughs> the place that we really need to look ultimately for leadership is to God. Yeah. At the end of the day. Yeah. Because look, if you look, if you spend time looking at politics, it'll just make you depressed. <clears throat> you know? It'll make you wanna Yeah, let's not go there. <laughs> Isaiah thirty three verse twenty two says, Look, the Lord is our judge. He's the one that's in charge. No matter what laws they pass. No matter how many sensible things they outlaw and say, no, that's illegal and that's wrong. No matter how many wicked things they say, yes, that's good and you need to promote it or you're wicked. Right's still right and wrong's still wrong. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. And that is what we need. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray you'd help us to make wise decisions. Each person here, Help us to think, what would you do? Not to be persuaded by what's popular, what's popular in social media, what's popular on the news, what's popular in our peer groups, but let us be persuaded by what is right, by what's popular with you. Lord, we thank you that you've called us to be a peculiar people. Help us to walk in a way that pleases you, Lord. And Lord, we pray that you would bless those that rule, bless them with wisdom, <coughs> bless them with, help them to make right decisions, even against what their plans and agendas and whatever financial interest they have. Help them to make decisions that surprise themselves. And bless your people with peace, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.